So, welcome everyone to the last presentation before lunch. And my name is Ahmed Darvish. I work at Linotronics for five years for five years now, uh, mostly working on BSPs and kernel development and other things. And for today, I would like to actually talk about some of the things that we were working on in the last three months approximately regarding CPU ID and the, X, the open source x86 ecosystem in general. So the first thing is I would like to quickly review the CPU ID instruction for people who might possibly be not aware about it and quickly discuss its semantics. So the x86 architecture provide this CPU ID of code and it takes basically as an input a leaf, which is the, uh, the main input of the instruction, and it takes something called the subleaf. And the subleaf is an optional input, and it takes it in the ECX register. So in, in x86, there is the common EX, EBX, ECX, and so on registers, and the input is EX and the optional input ECX. Uh, what it does output is information regarding the CPU and supported features. Runtime, of course. And the output format is actually a number of bit fields and the representation of the bit fields depend on the leaf. And these output are in the four registers, the EAX, EBX, ECX, and EDX. Uh, the same registers output is also on x86-64 so traditionally on x86, if you have other instructions, there is something called extended registers. Not in this case. So even on x86-64, the output is still on EX, EBX, ECX, EDX only, and, and only that. It is available on all modern x86 CPUs. And by that, we actually mean x86 CPUs released on the last 25 years or more. So most of the software on the ecosystem actually assumes its availability. Technically speaking, Intel and AMD asks you to check some E flags, but, but practically speaking, it is available and most software assume it is there. Uh, most importantly, it can run not only from kernel space, but it also runs, it can run from user space. And, okay. I guess I asked actually to make my slides full screen, so maybe someone is working on that. So. Okay, it will. Okay. Mysterious person, thank you. So. Okay, so then I should go on. <clears throat> so and I just need to remove some disturbing toolbar here on my side. And I hope it does not break things. It's okay. Uh, so yeah, so I was talking about the permissions and I was saying that most importantly, the CPU ID instruction can actually end is frequently invoked from user space. So it is not a privileged instruction, okay? Uh, the last thing, it is also, uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah, uh, nice, thank you. Who is doing that in the room or? Oh, okay, thank you. So, <clears throat> so thanks a lot, much nicer. So uh, the, the last thing, it is a serializing instruction. So just for your information. So actually there are some things to read. <laughs> I promise. So uh, yeah, okay, not bad. So uh, there are some uh, GC, uh, GCC and LLVM in the strings to help information. So there is actually a CPU ID count macro that it is provided at CPU ID dot H. And CPU ID.h here is just a header provided by the compiler, just like var args over standard arg.h for people who know that. Uh, both also uh, GCC and LLVM 
implement in strings called built-in CPU supports. And you can use that to query, does my CPU have, of course, at runtime we are talking about, uh, does my CPU have SSE3, SSE4, AVX, and other features? And these in strings are also extensively used in the ecosystem. A caveat, this does not cover all the CPU ID bit fields. <clears throat> this only cover around 30 or so of the most important features on x86 architecture. So I would like to show you now a, dem an, a demo implementation of the instruction. It is not really that complex. This is an inline, GCC, uh, inline assembly GCC expression. And you see in blue, this is the CPU ID of code itself. And you see in orange, the A, B, C, D. This actually stands for EAX, EBX, ECX, and EDX. And this is basically the output of the opcode. And this is where we tell GCC to uh, marshal the output. Yep. And uh, the input is in green, which is basically EEX, and this is the leaf number as we discussed. And then there is the ECX, which is the subleaf number. By default, I will talk in more detail about subleaves, but by default, it is zero for leaves which do not uh, have any more subleaves. And if you actually disassemble this function, you will see in the disassembly, it is just two bytes, zero F, A2, and and that's it. So, so it's really not that complicated instruction-wise. I'm just bothered because part of my slides, part, part of my slides here are covered by a stupid toolbar, but it's okay. Uh, so if I continue the demo, there is here, I am showing this, uh, listing the CPU ID in three leaves, leaf zero, leaf one, and leaf two. And basically I am invoking the inline CC macro that I showed in the earlier slide. This is the invoke CPU instruction. And then I am printing the output as, and as I mentioned from E, X, E. And this is actually the output of this. It's updated here, but not here. That's my bad day, it's okay. So it's... Okay, now it's updated here. Uh, yeah, so, so this is actually the output of the, of the demo, of the small program. And uh, as you see here, there are some bit fields in the four registers. I am only detailing for demonstration purposes, the first leaf, leaf zero, and you see in EEX there was a single bit field that was 16, which stands for, and you see it in bold black, and this stands for the maximum standard leaf. So basically this CPU supports standard leaves up to leaf 16. There is something called extended leaves we will talk about later. Uh, and then the EBX register, the ECX register, and the EDX registers, these actually contains the uh, vendor ID string. And I was running this in my laptop. So this is basically the genuine Intel string. And you see it in blue. I am matching in blue, green, and orange what stands for what. So. so that's it actually about the instruction, input, output, Permit nothing more complicated, but the interesting thing is the amount of data that this opcode can provide you on the x86 architecture. So here I would like to show you some sample data to just get a feeling of the instruction and the return data and what does it provide. So here, for example, I am uh, on the Linux. Yeah, it's still updates only here. Did this happen with everyone, or is it just me? Just you. Okay. <laughs> so, so as you see here, uh, this is the Linux command line, and uh, only on, on user space there is a really nice tool created by Todd Allen, and he has been maintaining it for almost 20 years. Uh, it is called Todd Allen CPU ID, or just CPU ID, 
and it is quite ubiquitous that it's actually in Debian, even the package is just called CPU ID. So you just do an apt install CPU ID and you get it. And here I am saying, please, uh, yeah, parse for me the information from CPU ID leaf one. And here saying, okay, in the output register EDX, here are the number of bits and yeah, all the standard features. And for people who are aware, these are the same uh, yeah, feature strings that you get. You see it in the standard proc uh, CPU info on x86. Uh, similarly, so I'm continuing the output and waiting for my slides to refresh. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and you see here the ECX, so the tool is, yeah, so there was more data on the ECX register, more bit fields. And here there is also other, other features, SSE3, virtual extensions, speed step, and so on. So if I go a little bit deeper, and I'm, I'm still using, yeah, I'm waiting for my slide. So I'm still using the uh, Todd Allen CPU ID thingy, and here I am saying, okay, please parse for me the information from leaf number, uh, leaf number B, and this time subleaf zero, and now we are beginning to encounter subleaves, and here it's saying that, okay, so this subleaf, uh, this leaf actually zero B on x86, uh, usually lists the CPU topology. So usually, especially on advanced uh, CPUs, there is not only like two levels of topology, there can be up to six levels of topologies. And this was an old development server and, and Unitronics. So the at topology level zero, so you see I'm doing CPU ID subleaf zero. And here it is saying that your level type is thread and this is, we are talking about hardware thread. So this is the, uh, yeah, hard logical CPU, Intel calls it hardware thread, AMD manuals calls it, it's hyper threading. And here it's saying number of logical processors at two. So this means I actually have hyper threading on this development server, okay? Uh, if there was no hyper threading, the number of logical processors will be one. So this is talking from a theoretical level at the topology level, how many CPUs, not across the whole system, but that's the topology I wrote. And then uh, I am saying, okay, please do the same, but for now, give me the subleaf one. And here the, out, the, out, the output is for the upper topology level. And here, okay, the level type is core and the number of logical CPUs is 56. Uh, if I actually continue and say subleaf three, uh, subleaf two, then it will tell me invalid. So there is an invalid marker, of course, so that you can navigate the topology. And the important part here is that in this development server, the number of cores is 56 times 2, 112. Uh, yeah, and yeah, that's basically it. But please, of course, note that this calculated number of CPUs might differ from uh, proc CPU info because proc CPU info shows you the online CPUs only due to the CPU kernel, uh, the kernel CPU hot plug might also differ from NPROC or SCED affinity because uh, both uh, NPROC and SCED affinity basically tell you the number of available CPUs. So if you have also a, co uh, a container and C groups and so on, so the number will be less. So, and this is why actually in make files, you know, so people use NPROC specifically. So. so I will go on quickly also. I'm sent, trying to give you a taste of the data that's returned by CPU ID. So, and more specifically, the subleaves. And here you will see that the concept of a subleaves is most of the time used to enumerate hierarchical hardware structures, okay? And on modern hardware, there is a ton of such hierarchies. So for example, leaf four, it will tell you that the deterministic cache parameters for the cache level, so another hierarchy. And then subleaf one will stand for level one, uh, subleaf two for level two and so on, and subleaf three for level three, the last level cache mostly. Uh, then, for example, leaf uh, hexadecimal 10, this is the Intel Resource Director thingy AMD platform quality of service. And in these things, there is like resource IDs hierarchy, and resource ID one is typically for cache segmentation at the L1 level, 
the source ID two is for cache segmentation at the L2 level and so on. Uh, yeah, and it goes on like that. So maybe I can then jump directly to leaf one F and leaf one F for example, it allows you to enumerate the entire CPU topology. This is actually V2, so this is only on modern Intel CPUs. And you can see that the topology of modern CPUs can go deep, actually. So we have hyper-threading, we then have cores, then modules and tiles, then dyes, and die groups, and so on. So this was only a sample. So it looks nice from the start, but the amount of data in that can be extracted from CPU ID is really huge. So, so far up to today, there are 52 standard and extended CPU ID leaves. And we talked that actually some of them also have sub leaves, so it's even more complex than that. The total number of bit fields is actually up to today, publicly known, is in the range of 830 to 850. And the reason I'm saying publicly known is that if there is a CPU vulnerability, usually a microcode update will then introduce a new bit that will tell you that, yeah, whether the vulnerability exists or not anymore, fixed or not. So, uh, so this is why some of these bits are also only listed in security advisories and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, a, a, a lot of them are also vendor specific. So. Uh, yeah, we mostly care about Intel and AMD these days. And yeah, the data is actually scattered around 15 manuals or so. So there is, of course, the main Intel SDM with the main listing, but there is a lot of manuals which mention other bits. So, okay. So the title of, so this was only just a quick, yeah, a quick summary of CPU ID for people who might not be aware about it. So the, cons the, the real talk actually is standardizing such data. So first, why do we want to standardize it? And also the origin story of how did we reach today? So, and I will just... So there is a lot of challenges today in how the Linux kernel is dealing with CPU ID information. The first one is actually possible future hardware designs. So heterogeneous cores might be a reality. We don't know, but given how the industry is moving, this might happen. Uh, for now on x86, all cores on a die group are actually the same feature-wise, but there is this known difference between P cores and E cores, performance cores versus energy cores. Uh, we don't know, we don't have internal information if this might change, but the rest of the industry is moving in that direction. And even Intel actually, CEO and such had multiple public speaking engagements where he mentioned Intel chiplets where you can have multiple nodes on the same chiplet, like three nanometers and five nanometers and stuff. So the industry, we might move into an extremely heterogeneous future. We are already there, but it might even move to a next point. Uh, yeah, but I already wrote a disclaimer there that this is not based on internal information. This is just our interpretation of how the industry is moving so far. A uh, second thing that actually is pressuring how the Linux kernel is, uh, how the CPU ID data is represented in the Linux kernel is CPU vulnerabilities. And the first thing is live microcode updates are becoming more common over the time. And there is actually a lot of case studies from hardware vendor customers who are really happy about it. But in the case of a CPU ID vulnerability, this might mean that you can apply a live microcode update post operating system initialization, and then one of the CPU ID bits can appear or disappear. And this can be tricky depending on the CPU ID bit. Uh, the second thing is operating system masking. And 
we might need in the future, if there is a CPU, if there is a CPU vulnerability, and we know that that vulnerability, yeah, user space should not use that feature, there might be interest from Linux to actually uh, mask that bit. Right now, AMD CPUs actually provide the capability of only being able to run the CPU ID instruction from kernel mode. And they give you the capability to actually raise, to actually trap the instruction. So uh, there is a CPU ID, but ironically, which can actually tell you if the CPU, if the CPU support only privileged CPU ID invocations. And in that case, we might actually move to a future where we can trap the CPU ID instruction and actually report. No. Thomas. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, okay, nice. So it's private information. Though. Sorry. Uh, yes, uh, for the call. Uh, Intel have had that since Ivy Bridge, and before Ivy Bridge, they also have some uh, masking MSRs. Uh, the AMD one is actually an override. It's not a mask, so you can also make features appear with it, which uh, we occasionally use for fun and games. Yeah, thanks. And is it possible, actually, that we will want to at least provide the CPU features across, like, a Linux own thing? instead of letting user space just run with CPU ID and do its thing? Uh, there are some cases where that's necessary and it's really, really, really slow. So what we are asking for for many years is basically give us a shadow CPU ID uh, memory space where the kernel can write to, and that's what exposed to user space. Oh, okay, nice. Thanks. So okay. they say, oh, it's too hard. Yeah, I mean, well, you, it took us only 20 years to get stable TSCs, so why? Yeah, not, not why really. are we expecting CPU ID to be fixed in five? I mean, oh, we got it from the source. So, <laughs> <clears throat> so at least on the hardware side, doesn't uh, SEV have a CPU ID page in memory they pull out to send to the guests? So, yeah. So if Intel is saying it's hard, we just have to point them over to the AMD implementation. <laughs> so, yeah. So these are, to get back in context, so these are actually the second challenges of how the kernel yeah, yeah, is representing CPU ID information now. The third thing is actually the existing Linux kernel code itself. So there is no central authority for CPU ID information. All the drivers just manually invoke, uh, not all, uh, a lot of the drivers manually invoke CPU ID everywhere, which is okay for now, but if we are moving again in the future to heterogeneous yeah, architectures, then this will be a problem because now you are running on a CPU and next time you get scheduled, you are on a different one. Uh, there is a lot of ugly bitwise handling on the kernel recently for CPU ID data. Sadly, a lot of code does what you see here in orange in the second point, which basically yeah, just like read leaf one, yeah, do some bitwise operations and yeah, it's quite ugly. Uh, there is a... It's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> Not, not the worst, let's call it this way. So there is also feature bits. Uh, this actually was the, not was, it is still the main way in the in the x86 tree to check for, to yeah, build the feature table and check features. And some of them is synthetic, but most of them actually has a one-to-one -one correspondence with the CPU ID bits, but they are incomplete. So they are there, but they are incomplete. Also, for people who do the usual cat proc CPU info, uh, yeah, uh, these flag names that you see, they are defined also at cpufeatures.h, but they are actually done in a very ugly way in some comment. And then there is a post-processing bash scripts that actually, bash or Perl, I don't remember, that actually generate C header from that. So, so it's, 
I'm not saying this to criticize anyone, of course. Uh, this code just organically grew since the original Linux 0 0.1. So it is the state of the world right now. So uh, Linux kernel wise. So, yeah, so there were efforts from the x86 maintainers to actually start to clean up things a little bit, given all the yeah, challenges or things that yeah, people know that needs to be fixed. Uh, Boris, actually, at Su when he was back at SUSE, uh, actually started some basic cleanups of the, C of the C99, uh, of the CPU ID uh, bit fields, which basically he added clean C structures with C with bit fields and then the rest of the code can at least do that instead of doing the ugly bitwise operations. This was around 2018. Uh, around 2000, yeah, just recently, some months ago, Thomas actually said, okay, uh, he asked me if I can look into that branch and actually try to build an in-kernel CPU ID data model that can handle yeah, or can start to handle some of the challenges we discussed. It's actually a very long-term effort here. Uh, yeah, and what we basically want is some data model that can actually, yeah, of course, have leaves and subleaves. Also, x86 vendor filtering, so we need to know automatically whether this bit is Intel only, AMD only, or both of them. Uh, and also, we need to encode the name of the proxy CPU info flags because sometimes they are different from the feature name. So there is a lot of interdependencies and, and we tried. So I actually started prototyping some models. Yeah, so just basic stuff to be honest, some C structure stuff and try to do it in a clean way. Uh, yeah, and if you see here, so this was like a representation of the multiple levels of course, I cut it down just to fit the slides. And you see I'm doing still the same ugly trick. For example, the SSE, the XMM3 here, this P and I is actually the name of the feature in proxy CPU info. So, so, but at the feature level, the x86 feature flags were called XMM3. And yeah, marketing-wise, people call them SSE3. So, and there is a lot of these, uh, yeah, basically, so we tried actually encoding the information in C as much as we can. And actually, like I, I iterated like four or five times and yeah, I would go back to Thomas and we tried to make it work, but there was a point where we actually realized that it, we, we can just do it at the C level, honestly, at this stage. Of course, in the end, the information will translate to some C representation, but we need some form of a machine readable format. And this machine readable format can actually encode all the things we talked about, the x86 feature bits, the proxy CPU info, uh, the vendor filtering, and even more things. So in Prague, I guess, yeah, the EOSS, the Embedded OSS conference, Thomas also met with Andrew Cooper, main Zen maintainer, and they actually uh, prototyped some initial data format. So not that this only fits the Linux kernel, but also the Zen hypervisor. So as a starting point. And not only that, but to make it also extensible enough to support other uh, software and not just at the kernel level. So for example, at the user space, I mentioned the Todd Allen CPU ID tool, so we even yeah, I want to target that. So, okay, we want to build a CPU ID database, right? So what it should be easy. So we had to evaluate actually several languages. Mike, please. So you might mention that we ask around if there is machine-readable information available at the various vendors. So there is, the answer was um, from both big x86 vendors. Yeah, we have some PowerPoint and some Word documents, maybe PDFs and... Yeah, but that, that would be very 
Yeah, it's all machine readable. <laughs> Still need to have uh, to parse 15 PDFs to get all of the information. <laughs> so it's implemented in microcodes. I can decode it from there. Yeah, sure, great. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. <laughs> So yeah, so uh, and yeah, so as we said, actually Thomas asked, and yeah, so there are some things, but not ideal. But yeah, so we want to actually represent this information. And remember when I said that there are 850 bit fields, eight, around 850 bit fields, right? And each one has attached information about the feature flags, the CPU info other usage needed by Linux, other usage markers by the Zen hypervisor. So it actually is a complicated task. And what we ideally need, so I talked at the start of the slides that the CPU ID data, especially the subleaves, are deeply hierarchical, right? And that's just a feature of modern hardware in general. So we needed something that can represent an extensible annotated tree. So extensible tree is understandable. A tree structure is also understandable because of all the hierarchies under each leaf and subleaf and so on. And I really evaluated, given these constraints, JSON, YAML, TOML, S expressions, the Lisp thingy, and, and, and XML. And it was only XML and S expressions which, which we were able to do a hierarchical structure and do annotations on these nodes, okay? So, for example, for YAML, you can, of course, do a hierarchical structure. But the moment you want to add annotations per node, you need to encode that annotations as part of the tree, as part of the hierarchy, okay? And this led actually to an explosion of vertical lines per node. So you would look at one node and then you will not even be able to understand your position in the file and so on. So, and the same for JSON, Tommel actually was even worse. Its support for hierarchies was extremely primitive. And it was only XML which was able to have this tree structure, of course, but also with annotations per node, which is something like attributes. And also as expressions, because actually you can have a one-to-one -one mapping between an XML, even a really complex one, and as expressions. So even when XML actually was introduced, the Lisp guys showed it just you know, a little bit noisier as expression. So, so yeah, so now, actually, the filtering is, okay, we have JSON, YAML, TOML, S expressions, XML. Now it's filtered to S expressions and XML. And from there, of course, the XML ecosystem won, even though the S expressions actually looked nicer, even for, especially for someone like me who likes Lisp. But in the end, there was the benefits of the XML ecosystem. You had a great schema language, whether you want to use RelaxNG or XSD or whatever. Uh, you had extremely powerful, and I will show you some examples of query, query language and a transformation language. And the rest of, the, of this talk, I will show you extremely, uh, yeah, I will show you ex uh, the extremely beneficial uh, transfer, usage of such XML tree. So, this is actually some of the sample. Oh my God, yeah, time move quickly. So uh, this is actually one of the samples. So what I did is, okay, we agreed on a representation for all the leaves, uh, a schema, of course. So we really prototyped multiple schemas until what we reached what we believe is the optimal schema for our use case. And in that schema, there is something like that. And as you see here, there is the leaf ID, 
and the leaf ID is one. And from there, there is the subleaf ID zero. And then this is a description of the output register. Okay. So you see here the EEX output register, and these are the descriptions of the bit fields within the EEX register. And from there, you can see that here is bit zero, and here is the ID and a short description. And this bit is actually supported by both Intel and AMD. And uh, on the second field, it's also the same and the length of the bit field. And we did that for the 850 bit fields. So each bit field in the database that we built actually has this level of detail. Okay? That's the first part. What does that mean? Uh, What does the vendor actually mean here? Does this mean that like you have to do a vendor check before you read this bit, or does that like which vendors this bit might appear it's on? It's supported by that vendor, which means that this <coughs> bit actually in Intel have the CPU model IDs to it. And it's the same on AMD, but outside of this, we don't know what its interpretation. And if this only was like one line Intel without the others, then to to our knowledge, this bit is only interpreted like that for Intel CPUs. Okay, so that's more, it's more documentation than to say, before you read this bit, you have to do a vendor check or something. Mm, I mean, we will talk about generators and we can utilize this information, but so far it is documentation. It, the, the idea was that we want to enable the people like uh, uh, running web, web pages on, on CPU ID and, and whatever, or, or user space tools to be able to filter on that. And, and but for, for, in the first place, for the kernel purposes, it's mostly documentation right now. But we choose XML on purpose, so even people who want to do uh, web pages with extensive description. So, and then uh, there is also here another, another XML, actually a continuation, and you see that we also have usage hints for the Linux kernel and as an hypervisor. And here, for example, we say that this bit is the x86 feature bit, and the proc command, the proc CPU info actually exists for that bit. So, and we, for the Zen, we have similar attributes. This is um, a more complicated case. So it's also, we don't also, also do vendors, we also do hypervisors. Like there are some bits which are only supported by KVM or Zen and so on. So we also list this to the best of our knowledge. Uh, this is a nice case of the, of the topology uh, we talked about. So here, this is actually leaf1f. This is just Emacs, the name of the file there. And you see that, okay, the field domain level, blah, blah, the field. And you see here, these are also the possible interpretations for that field, to the best of our knowledge, when this was written. Uh, there is, as I mentioned, all the 830 plus bit fields are actually extensively covered. Uh, I also wrote generators for multiple components. And the first generator was actually a, a C header file generator which we plan to use at a certain point in the future, also in the Linux kernel. So, so we do not want to have this tool as a build dependency of the kernel. So we don't want to bother anyone with XML and stuff like that. So the expectation is that the output of this tool will be committed and then the maintainers will inform some discipline that if there is any bug fixes or updates, you actually update it on the upstream. So the Linux kernel will be our downstream and the Zen hypervisors and other areas. And here, for example, I'm using XSLT and yeah, I only have four minutes. So, and XSLT is an extremely powerful transformation engine because XSLT basically give you the XML tree and then you can have total control on it. So, uh, for example, this is just a very quick example, the second line. 
Here I am saying in just one line, go to the XML tree, go uh, two levels deep, and then give me the local name, filter this by all the elements which start with bit, then, uh, yeah, then extract the ID attribute of that element, then take its length, then actually give me the maximum in the whole file, okay? And all of this is actually in the second line. So it's extremely powerful. I, I was actually personally surprised. And so the generators are very small. So the C structure generator are 150 lines of stuff like that, declarative language. There is also another generator. Uh, this is basically the tool that, this is just an interface, but internally, as I mentioned, we have the XSLT transformers. And this is also another generator which I wrote for the Linux kernel KCP ID tool. It's a small tool under tools arc x86. And originally there was only uh, 200 fields or so covered. There is a patch series which I will send after <laughs> this talk, uh, which actually uh, covers the entire 830 bit fields that are scattered over actually these 15 plus documents. So, so and this is another example also of the listing and all the bit fields and so on. This is also an example of the generated header files. So this is, uh, yeah, so this is leaf four, sub leaf zero, it's in the bottom, the name of the structure, and this is the EX, EBX, ECX, and so on. Uh, yeah. So most, most important to, to, for me to notice is that this is extremely flexible, so we actually spent a really good time internally iterating to make sure that we have a strong foundation, we can generate whatever we want. So seriously, so not exaggerating. Uh, I will send an announce to the Linux kernel mailing list after this talk. This will be about the project. There is a URL there which will also be, for now, a redirect to the GitLab project when you can also talk with me and I can also show you some nice demos if you want after the talk or, or tomorrow. That's it for me for this talk. So if there is any final questions or? I did not understand how to add a new CPU ID. Suppose I have to add a new CPU ID feature. Shall I send to that website or how does? Oh, you mean the project, where's the Yeah, how, like, how do I add a new one? Now? Oh, yes. So this is actually just uh, a redirect to the GitLab project, and it's a project hosted on GitLab. So I send a pull request or something to do that? Yes. Okay. So if if people in the kernel want to also send the normal patch over oh, mailing list, it's also okay. So, so you can send, send to x86 mailing list, and you can uh, pick it from I there? I didn't or? get the final approval, but this is the plan. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so the, the the thing I would I want to do in the in the future when this is really available, and it is, uh, so everything which comes new into the kernel and has a new CPU ID, whatever thing, uh, go there, update the database, and generate the data structure for you. Let it generate the data structure for you, and then use it in your code. Because I really I'm so tired of decoding all these. 50,000 different unreadable, unforceable, uncomprehensible macros. It's, it, it makes my brain boggy. And just these data structures are so nice because they tell you what it is. Somebody claimed recently that the macros are more efficient. This is total bullshit. I tried it, and actually the text size generated with a bit field based data structure was roughly. 15% smaller than the macro mess created one because the compiler can't even look at it correctly. So because it's 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 too late to to actually think about optimization. You wanted to say something. No. Okay. <laughs> On ARM64 we have an in kernel table not as advanced as this but one of the things that we have there is a bunch of uh, information on how to decode the field. So for example, if you have a field that's a signed field or an unsigned field, if it's packed and shifted and that sort of thing, uh, do you have that information today and is that in scope for future? Uh, basically, 
Yeah, all of our bit fields are just unsigned. So we don't have any typing system regarding the actual bit fields. If there is a need, maybe, but we assume that, I mean, the bit fields themselves actually are like C-wise, the bit fields are like a subtype of U32. So there is. Oh, sure. It's just that uh, one of the issues that we found, which is why on ARM64 we introduced something very similar, is that people were unpacking these bit fields incorrectly. So they'd extract the correct bits, mm -hmm. but then fail to do the thing to convert it to the correct type to interpret it correctly. And I'm not sure if that's a problem for you or not. But I'll Why would it. they? In for some of the leaf, it's a problem. Um, we still have to to figure it out. But that's the basic. So the, the most important one that I wanted to have. Oh, it's six bits here, and not. Uh, I tapped some macro and got it wrong. The magic constant. I was just going to say, uh, off the top of my head, I'm not aware of any signed data uh, in, yeah, in x86's yeah. view here, but not beyond the uh, realm of possibility to add information like that. Yeah, yeah, you have a so you have a unit factor on it. That's that's true. Uh, it's not in, it's in the documentation. It's not encoded right now, but that's something which can be added on top easily. That, Guys, we are running out of time a bit, so sorry. But uh, yeah, we have a break, so I'm available if anyone. So wants if to... anybody wants to continue and, and they don't go yeah. to lunch, yeah, yeah. yes, it's up yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.